All right, folks, I'm here with Clint Arthur. Uh, you may have seen him on CNN, Today's Show, BBC, Sky News, Forbes, Fox. He's been on all of it. Uh, he's the author of the book Wisdom of the Men. And uh, it's it's up for a uh, nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. There it is, Wisdom of the Men. Pretty impressive. Now, you just told me before we started recording, you have Mick Jagger, Mike Tyson, Donald Trump. Joe Biden. Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton. I am an equal opportunity celebrity selfie slut, and I got selfies with just about every single famous person in the world in this book. And you got a quote from each of them, or like you asked them all, what's the most important thing you've learned in your life? And they yeah. gave you what they felt was the most important thing they've learned in their life, and you put it into a book. Yeah. That's incredible. It's, it's been quite a journey. You know, I grew up in New York City, and the first story in this book is about when I went to Studio 54 when I was 15 years old and I met Andy Warhol in Halston. Andy and, Warhol, wow. You know, that's, that's one of the early stories. But, you know, I'm a native New Yorker and I wanted to do this interview because the world has changed so much and it's so improbable that I would be now spending the vast majority of my time here in Mexico. That's why I've got these flags set up the way they are. Uh, if you had ever told me that me, a graduate of PS40, junior high school 104, Stuyvesant High School, I went to the University of Pennsylvania Wharton Business School. If you had ever told me that I would be living in a small city in Mexico because New York City had become communist and that I would need a passport in order to enter a be restaurant. Be careful with that word, though. Be careful with that word. <laughs> Boogeyman passport. Call the boogeyman. Some, some kind of pass. If you yeah, this is your the, papers, may I see your papers, please? Yes. Papers, and that's why we're calling this interview Nazi Germany, 1939, all over again, because that's the way I see what's going on. I have said to my Canadian friends and clients, "Are you insane? You need to leave Canada." That, I mean, how can you stay there? So and we're not that far away. You're saying basically we are at that point of 1939 Germany when the smart Jews were like, ah, something's going on here. I'm getting the hell out. That's where we're at right now. You know, I have always thought I've been interested in gold. And one of the things I want to talk about is gold today and how you can safely and smartly travel with gold across borders. Because for years, I'm Jewish. And for years and years and years, I've wondered, would I have marched myself into a gas chamber in World War II for the Nazis? And I don't think I would. And I've, and I've all long, long time, I've thought to myself, I should have some gold in case I need to bribe a guard to get across a border. I, I, this is the kind of things yeah. I've thought about for years because of you know the world. And I was coming back from LA a couple of months ago and I had some American gold coins on me. And lo and behold, I was stopped mm -hmm. by a you know, national security, national guardsman at the airport in Mexico City. They wanted to examine these coins. And he asked me, this is really, this is takeaway number one for all the patriots and for any American or smart person who is gonna have some gold coins on them or some gold. He asked me, what's the value of these coins? I said, well, it's stamped right on the coin. It says $50, it's just $50. Now, anyone who knows a one ounce gold American coin is stamped $50, an American Eagle, the current 2021 American Eagle says $50 on the coin but the value of the American Eagle is one ounce of gold, which is $1,800. Right, right. So, yeah. you know, when you're traveling internationally, instead of traveling with gold bars or fractional pieces of gold, it's smarter to travel with actual coins that have a value stamped on it because the value is always far less than the actual value of the coin. And it allows you to go between countries without having to declare or without having to, you know, raise any eyebrows that you have lots of money on you because, you know, even if you had 10 
of those one ounce gold coins, which would be worth over $18,000. If you had that, it, it would only be really worth $500. 50 right. times 10 is 500. So that's a smart way for people to have some, some valuable things with them that you'll always be able to transform into it's cash or, or valuable services or commodities or food or, or a house or whatever you need. It's going to come real in handy now because what we're seeing with hyperinflation, uh, empty shelves at stores, uh, we got the cargo ships being uh, stranded out in the ocean, kept out in the ocean. I mean, bro, this is this is real. And I told everybody this was going to be nuclear. And I didn't mean even like a nuclear war, but there might be a nuclear threat. You never know. I think I think there's some there's there's some there's a international affairs that are going to be heating up. Everything's coming to a tipping point. It's 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 all happening. We're watching it right now. When did you leave? America, when did you leave New York City to go to Mexico? Two weeks to slow the spread. I said to my wife, hey, baby, do we want to go back to our apartment on the 13th floor in Midtown Manhattan with all those old people who live in our building? Or do we want to go to our property in Los Angeles, which we hate? We've hated it for so long because L.A.'s homelessness problem and the overbearing police and the people in LA, it's, you know, I, I couldn't stand it. So I got out after a long time and moved back to New York. Or do we want to rent a house in Florida or Arizona, which we don't know anything about? Or do we want to go to our favorite resort in Mexico and make it a vacation? And that's what we did. Two weeks to slow the spread turned into four and a half months. And we have always loved looking at houses in real estate. We started looking at real estate after the first month just casually to see what's available. And we ended up buying a villa at the end of August. Uh, we made the offer and we closed in November of 2020. You, you kind of monitored, you kind of watched what was happening in America and you're like, you know what? We're not going back. You saw where this was going. You saw where the tide was going. We, we, we know what happened in 2020 with the, let's just call it the heist, the uh -huh. heist of 2020. That was, should have been like the first indicator, like, oh, shit's going south fast for the smart people. We saw, we saw this. We go, okay, we know what happened. They robbed us. They robbed, which I'm used to in boxing. <laughs> they robbed us. It was a rock. I got robbed. It was, we got robbed, and now we knew this is going to be a fast slide. To me, Biden is a Trojan horse for the deep state, the CCP. And what we're seeing right now is what I've told people all along. It's going to be record. It's like a plane going down and we're all hostages on it, right? It's shocking that they could do what they did in November of 2020. It's unbelievable that a theft like that could happen, that it could be allowed to happen. I mean, where, where are the fail safe? Where are our safeguards? Where are the people who we pay lots of money to to protect us? The three letter agencies, the military, how come no one stepped in? And, you know, there's this theory of devolution. And it's funny in Mexico, when you go to the Home Depot to return something, they say cambio or devolución. Devolución. See, that's return. Yeah. I, I, I am hoping and praying every day for the theory of devolution. And I have to believe that that Donald Trump was smart enough. He was to put this stuff into action because he was either the greatest or the worst president we ever had. If he didn't do devolution, he's the worst president we ever had because he let it just go away. Right. And he gets us to the believe, finish line and says, fuck it, I'm out. You're I don't wrong. believe it's possible. I don't that's, believe it's possible. I really that's, don't. Yeah, the guy yeah. is too smart, too nice. He's in the book. Nicest guy. Nicest guy. So charming. We went to a rally and met him at a rally. He comes right over. We're like standing on the rail after the rally is over, waiting for autographs. He comes right over to my wife. He goes, oh, this is a gem here. And he gives her a big kiss right on the cheek. I go, <laughs> I go, I went to Wharton, Mr. Trump. He goes, that's a good school. This is a gem here. You got to take care of this one. And I said, can I get a selfie, sir? He goes, go ahead. So that's the picture oh. that's in the book. Oh, he what is a such a lovable man. guy. He's Papa Trump. I call him Papa Trump. I swear to God, I felt like he was my dad. I really did. I got that same vibe. And to that, I just want to say, you know, my dad passed away in 06. I'm so grateful he doesn't have to live through what's going on right now. He was a World War II veteran. And if he would see what's happening now in, in our country, he would be just mortified. He'd be sick. He, he wouldn't want to see it. And I'm happy that he's in a better place. 
But you know, you know, I, look, I watched your interviews with Juanito, and uh, I believe that there's a lot of stuff going on, and I and I really hope and pray every day that we're going to get to the point where we can have a return to sanity. That's what we need: a return to law and order, a return to justice, a single tier justice system, and a return to sanity in in the United States and the rest of the world. I've, I've talked to Juanito a lot in private as well, and he said that. Um... You know, the correction of this, there has to be some kind of there's safeties in place and devolution is involved, but there's safeties in place to where it's not as extreme as people think it's going to be with devolution. But devolution is involved to a degree, but they're sa- we're watching the Democratic Party. We're watching the government cannibalize itself. They're like throwing gasoline on each other and giving each other matches, basically, is what we're watching right now. And, and as we see this play out, people need to be red pilled. This is from what I understand. And as it plays out and it goes forward, then there, there are safeties in place, but there needs to be some kind of event. Could, could be a nuclear event, could be some, a scare event, a, miss, a Cuban Missile Crisis type of event. That's what Juanito says, right? Yeah. But what, what, you know, where we're at right now is 1930. It's scary. It's 1939 Nazi Germany. And you saw this in 2020 and you said, you know what? Would I have gone to the gas chamber? And you got the hell out of here, man. And I have so many friends that are losing their jobs because of this. I have so many, you, you go to stores, you see people wearing the face diaper. They're just, they're, 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 they're like, they're complying. And that's, what's giving them power is everyone fucking complying to this. I don't understand why people don't stop. I walk through airports in the United States and I never work in airports and everyone looks at me like I'm weird. And I look at them like they're out of their freaking minds because you've got to draw a line at some point. I remember during the 15 days to slow the spread, the United States said, we advise all Americans to return from abroad. If you're overseas, you should return to the United States. And they had those images of all the people at Chicago O'Hare Airport jammed into a reception hall, no social distance, no mask, nothing. And I'm sitting in my hotel room in Mexico with my wife at our favorite resort. And I'm saying to myself, that is not what I'm doing. See, as a celebrity entrepreneur, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not famous, but to my clients and prospects, I'm somebody very special. And one of the, one of the philosophies that I use is I, I want to do everything the opposite of what everybody else is doing. That's why I don't really do Facebook lives. Everybody does Facebook lives. I go on TV news and talk shows, right? So it's, it's in my DNA to do the opposite of what everyone did. I, I heard or read about this Australian company that were in the Himalayan mountains. They had sold all their possessions to go on a year and a half trip around the world. And they got the call to go back to Australia. They went back to Australia from the Himalayan mountains. And then they were quarantined in a hotel for a month. I mean, what are people thinking? You really have to be smart about this stuff. And whenever I hear a government agency say anything, I believe the opposite is true. 100%. So when I, when I heard Jerome Powell say that inflation was transitory, that's when I started to buy gold. Because that's when I believe that, hey, if he's saying that inflation is nothing, then it really must be a problem. And I really do believe it's a problem. And I, I don't think it's an accident. I don't think any of this stuff, unfortunately, when, when people refer to the politicians as being inept or stupid, that's not true. This, none of this is ineptitude or stupidity. Everything they're doing is on purpose. They are setting out to destroy the United States and it is the elected leaders who are doing it. The so-called elected leaders. And the, and the three-letter agencies are compromised. Uh, they're all captured operations, as Juan would say. They're all captured operations. And we even see, like, it was surprising to me to see Brett Kavanaugh. Surprising. I couldn't believe it. I mean, well, I can believe it. Let's just be honest. I can believe anything now. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I used to watch documentaries of World War II, of Hitler. Like, and I used to think to myself, how did he get this country to do this? How did he get everyone so damn brainwashed? How did this happen? And here I am today going, oh, yeah, okay, I see it now. Watching everybody, you know, everywhere I go, I mean, dude, everywhere I go, I'm in El Paso, everywhere I go, people are wearing face diapers still. They don't have to, but they're still doing it. They're still 
doing it and they look at me like I'm nuts. Like I walk in like street. I'm wearing a fucking Michael Jackson glove when I go out or something. This fuck people look fucking nuts. I, I look at them like, no, I'm normal. I'm smiling. I'm laughing. I'm talking. I'm conversing. But they look at me like, whoa, this guy's walking into the restaurant with a with a face diaper without a face diaper. What's wrong with him? It's crazy to me. In the street in the car while they're sitting in the car by themselves. Look, I really try to have compassion for these people because they are afraid. They've got to be afraid or else they wouldn't be doing it, right? Uh, they're also programmed and they're living, they're, they're asleep. They really are. They're living, they're like sleepwalking through life. And unfortunately, according to Juanito, they, enough of them have to wake up, enough of them have to wake up in order for the devolution to happen. And I really wish that people would wake up. I don't know how the people can. I mean, I got so many fraternity brothers who were contributing $25,000 to the Joe Biden campaign. Oh, it blows my mind. That so blows many. my mind too. I mean, I think once gas hits $8, $10 a gallon, people are going to be like, Ooh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's what it's going to take. That's what, but that's why that's serious. I mean, you can, these people, obviously they don't care about what, so they may not like it, but they're like, ooh, you got to do it. You know, you got to be, you got to be, uh, you, you got to have sympathy for your fellow, your fellow man. You got to be polite. It's like a polite a thing. It's like they, they've turned it into like caring for your fellow man. Like, ooh, I don't want to get the elderly sick. I don't want to, when this was all engineered six, you know, six feet apart, the whole thing, it's common. Yep. The propaganda is shocking. I can't really watch. I used to watch three hours of Fox News every day. I can't watch any of it now. And you go they on Fox talk, News. <laughs> they, they, they don't talk about anything that's real. They talk about 2024. We can't get to 2024 unless we go back and fix 2020. We just can't go forward unless we go backwards. And uh, I really hope that we, we can rectify this situation and bring some sanity back. What's your thoughts on the filibuster? Like, what do you think is going to happen with that? I'm a, very impressed with the way our government has been set up. I mean, the fact that they've been able to not pass Build Back Better. I mean, that's, that's real testament to the founding fathers genius right there. I mean, how they have been unable to get that legislation to move forward. I can't, I cannot understand it. And I have to believe that the same thing is going to happen with the filibuster. So I think that's going to be safe. I mean, it's really um, great that the Supreme Court shut down the, uh, the mandate for companies with 100 plus employees as being unconstitutional. That's, that's an amazing thing. That's very hopeful. But, you know, and what happened with Prince Andrew recently is very hopeful. There's, there's a lot of good stuff that's happening. I just wish that you know, I wake, I, I, I wake up every morning, I open up Apple News, and I'm praying that there is a picture of a tank in front of the White House. Exactly. I'm, 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 the, I'm the same way. I, <laughs> I believe we're living in a quickening, though. I think this year, 2022, is going to be like a quickening. Things are going to happen so much faster, like time and space, just warp speed. Like, I think, you know, what used to happen every month is started happening every week. And now what's happening every week is happening every day. And now it's, or now it's every moment. Every time I check my phone, there's an update, 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 update. This yep. guy stepped down. That guy stepped down. This Democrat is not running for reelection. So I believe things are happening behind the scenes. I think it adds up. Well, um, Charlie Ward talks about how last year was the year of the ox. And this year is the year of the water tiger and that the water tiger is super fast. And I do believe a lot of this stuff that's going on in our world, unfortunately, is orchestrated by China. And the Chinese are very in touch with these astrological symbols of theirs. And this year is going to be a faster year. And I think about what Juanito says, that it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. And that's why I'm here in Mexico, because Look, you know, I, I, I'm not saying that every patriot should leave. If every patriot left, there would be nothing left of the country. But, you know, what I am saying is that the powers that have the power 
to do something about this need to do something about this. They really do. It's we did our jobs. We voted overwhelmingly. There's never been an election with a turnout like that. And and that's one of the great legacies of 45 is creating such awareness of politics and the importance and opening people's eyes to what's really going on and the corruption. That's going to be one of his great legacies. But for people who don't have faith or are willing to be more proactive about their own safety and their future and their life. I mean, living in Mexico is a lot less stressful than living in Midtown Manhattan. That's all I can say. And, you know, I lived in Manhattan my whole life. I grew up in Manhattan. There's a great line in the Broadway show, Rent. I'm a New Yorker, fears my life. Okay, that's, sure. <laughs> that's a line from the Broadway show Rent. That's what it's like to live in New York under normal circumstances. Now you got people coming out of Home Depot. Like I went into the Home Depot, some giant guy just slams into me and he's like, what are you doing, man? Not wearing a mask, playing games. This is a man. I mean, I was this close to getting my ass kicked by some giant guy who's like freaked out over the. Wow. And I'm like, uh, they don't yeah. even have a test that actually yeah. identifies it. What are you talking about? Yeah. It's, it's, and I got it's, clients who are saying, I can't come to, I, I'm not traveling right now because of Omicron surging. Really? How do they know Omicron is surging? What are they using to identify that Omicron? How, how yeah. do they know? And these and, people are doctors who are right. saying. And that's oh, what's scary. Oh, <laughs> That's the most, that's what's the scariest thing about this is how ah. the doctors are pushing this. Mm. They're, they're so scared to go against the narrative. I mean, I can't believe how well organized and orchestrated this, this is. I mean, think about it. For, to, to be able to pull this on the American public, they had to use propaganda, politicians. They have their ducks in a row. They have their, peoples in play, their people in place to do this. This took decades of planning, decades of planning. Do you agree with that? I definitely do. I'm, this is a well orchestrated, gigantic information war. There's, I mean, Alex Jones is so smart the way he called his show Infowars. Yeah. And I didn't understand it until maybe a year ago. And it's clearly what we're in right now. And the way they have pulled this over the, the eyes of every American, it's just like, Man, I mean, look, two weeks to slow the spread. Okay, we, we went along with that because the propaganda at that point was so intense. But I remember way back in the beginning seeing a report from China where the person was saying, it's fake, it's fake. It's, it's not real, this, this yeah. disease is not real, it's fake. And you know, how, how do you know what to believe? That's the thing. And this is my second big takeaway is that, you know, I talked about gold and I'm sure there's other things before this, but how do you know what to believe these days? Yeah. The only yeah. things I watch are so-called conspiracy theory podcasts. That's, that's all I watch anymore. I, you know, if I'm on <laughs> Facebook, if I'm on Facebook and I see, you know, one of my friends or clients is on some kind of newscast and they're talking about something constructive, like we do, then I, you know, I'll watch that. I'll watch when they're talking about how to, how to cure your kids, uh, ear infection without antibiotics, you know, yeah. or, you know, how to be happy. I got one client who's a happiness expert, you know, how to be happy in the face is your loneliness killing you. That was her topic. You know, I'll watch <laughs> stuff like that on TV, but I, I can't watch irrelevant propaganda. No. And, that's all that's out there. So how do you know what to believe? Well, personally, I believe anything the government says is, is the opposite. So whenever I hear them say anything, I believe the opposite. And anytime I'm watching anything, I really have to be a very discerning buyer. That's what I call it. And in this case, I'm buying into the ideas that the expert is talking about on TV or on a podcast. I really have to think, where is this person coming from? What's their agenda? What are they really trying to sell? And what are they trying to manipulate me to do and why? And when you ask yourself those questions, then you can come to an answer about 
well, do I want to believe or buy into any of this? Or is it just entertainment? Like, you know, some of the podcasts that I watch, I, I watch them just for entertainment purposes, you know? All right. And, and the other thing is, I think it's very important to try to find inspirational things to listen to or to watch. I don't know if you know the Reverend Joel Osteen. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, that is such an oasis of positive inspiration in a sea of negative worldview and negative things going on in the world, you know, the reality of the world. So I, I you know, I, what I've done is I've, I've turned off Fox. I've turned off. I don't watch CNN. I, the only time I watch Fox or CNN, I like to see what they're telling the public, what they're, what bullshit they're feeding everybody. So yeah. I can pick apart that and, and bring it onto my program to where I'm like, okay, this is what they're selling. You don't want to buy it. You know what I mean? That's the only reason I watch that stuff or I'll pick apart what I'm looking at. You know, hopefully those giant media channels can be returned to sanity. You know, I, I've got to figure that at some point CNN is going to lose so much value that they're going to just want to sell it or to change it. They'll either change it themselves or they'll sell it. And that's where Donald Trump's going to come in and buy it with his media acquisition company. That would be the greatest thing. If he could come in and buy CNN and make it back to what it used to be, it used to be so amazing. It used to be the best thing in the world. And now yeah, just, they've lost 90% of their viewership. 90. They deserve to lose that viewership because they only put out propaganda and lies. And that's right. unfortunate. And then look at someone like Joe Rogan. He's beating all of them. Fox, all of Joe Rogan is beating everybody. He is a true phenomenon and a genius and a, a great interviewer, a great listener. You know, when I interviewed Jocelyn Elders, the 15th Surgeon General of the United States, I said, what's the most important thing you ever learned? And she said, to listen. And he's very, very good at listening. And so are you. I was watching the interview you had with uh, Juan O'Savin and that woman like last week. And you just Our sat there and listened for most of that interview. And, and you interject some points and that's good. But well, listening is a really lost art that a lot of people should work on. Well, you got to still st you got to still steer the, the the conversation. You know what I mean? But I can't just you know, a lot of people get pissed because I interject. Maybe I'm getting better at it. But 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 uh, it's like you got to still steer the conversation. You know, I have a lot of questions that I want to ask and points I want to make a lot. It's a conversation. We're going back and forth. We're volleying, you know. I've done 111 television interviews on network television shows around the world. When I was on the Today Show with Willie Geist and Brooke Shields, it was a fascinating thing because Brooke Shields is not a quote unquote great interviewer, but Willie Geist is. And when I was on that show, I mean, I've been on every show from Biloxi, Mississippi to Los Angeles, New York and 30 Rock. And when I was on the Today Show, the quality of the questions and the quality of the interview that Willie Geist did was just so far above so many other shows that I've been on. You really can appreciate when you're working with a super professional like a guy like Willie Geist who knows how to ask a question, knows how to jump in and when to jump in and not make it sound like he's stepping on somebody. That's another good reason to watch those shows for a person like yourself yeah. who's an interviewer to like try to pick up fine points on being an interviewer. I'm learning on the job. Hey. <laughs> I got thrown in, dude. I'm like, oh, I'm learning on the job. So, but I, I just have fun with it. You know, fuck it. I'm just having a good time. And it shows. And that's why people enjoy your show. That's one of the reasons I watch is that when you turn on a TV show or a podcast or any kind of interview, you're inviting those people into your life. Really, these days, you're inviting them into your brain because oftentimes you're wearing head so headphones and it just goes straight in. So if the person doesn't have a pleasant demeanor, if they don't come across as being genuine and honest and natural, if they come across as fake in any way, you just go on to the and next. And everything's thing. fake today. Go Just look on Instagram. Everything is filters and it's just all fake. I mean, you know, it's just, it's unbelievable. Like it's, we're living in such a fake world that I think being authentic is like a, a cut above the rest. To be honest with you, I'm not scared to be myself. It doesn't, I, I, I just, I am who I am. You know, that's just, just it. You get what you see. 
I cuss. Hey. I drop the f bomb constantly. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> Amen, man. I'm I'm all for it. I I try to to like use good language because I'm an author and I'm you know I do a lot of media and I like I was just on a big show. I was on a big show recently called um, Coast to Coast AM with George. Oh, Murray. I love it. I love that. Great love show, that. right? I've been on that show four times. And the last time I was on, I was telling the story of how somebody told me to go screw myself. <laughs> okay. And they got pissed off at me. The producer of the show like called me. I, ca I called the producer the next day because George Norrie was like, whoa, whoa, watch your language. And I didn't know what he was talking about. And the next day I called the producer and I, and I, I sent an email. I, I showed him how they talk about going to screw your, go screw yourself on, on friends, on Seinfeld, on every show they use that go screw yourself. And he goes, yeah, well, we have a higher standard. He's like, don't you know what that means? That's the whole point. I didn't say, I didn't say what it means. I said the euphemism for what it means. Right, right. Right. I don't think go screw yourself is a bad thing. I think that's what you're supposed to say on TV or on the radio. So absolutely, absolutely. And but in my book, I, now on television, I mean, come on, it's just, it's just ridiculous. Oh but you know, God. when I do, when I do commentating, boxing and stuff like that, I don't cuss. I know when to pull back. I know when I'm on a show where I'm like, well, I can't cuss on this one, you know, and I don't, I don't, I know when to do it. And this is my, this is my show. I can do what I want on my show. You know what I mean? So that's the way, that's the way I see it. And, and I, I'm so passionate about what I talk about that I can't hold back. It's like a fight. I'm not going to hold back my left hand or my right. I'm going to fucking drop that bitch. In this day and age, you got to use everything you got to get everything you can. And, you know, I interviewed Janae Noonan. She's an MMA fighter, uh, gold medalist for Team USA. And she said one of the smartest things. Oh, my God. She goes, you know, you're getting good when you start getting hit hard. Because in the beginning, when you're starting out, you're never fighting against people who are any good. So you don't get hit hard. And if you do fight anyone good, they take it easy on you. But when you start getting hit hard, that's when you know you're getting good because you're fighting people who are good. And it was in it was in a situation with Dr. Oz's agents when basically the agent told me to go screw myself. That's where that story came from. That's the story I was telling. And you know, <laughs> as we're getting bigger, as we're getting into matches with better and better opponents and that's where the world is going that's where the world is going and there's a lot of people who are not good enough to continue living i know quite a few people who have died because they were not smart and took the medicine that they shouldn't have taken or they or they got in situations where they went in the hospital and the hospital killed them that happens all the time they didn't have access to the medications that you can easily get in Mexico. I got it. I take it, I take it all the time. And uh, just for prophylactic purposes, I had, I had the disease allegedly in September of 2020. And I was, I had a high fever for 10 days. And then on the, on the 11th day, I woke up with a heart on and I knew I was healed. <laughs> so <laughs> I think I've had the, I think I've had it like five or six times, but I, I won't get tested. So I don't know, but I, I will say this. How's the propaganda in Mexico like compared to America? I mean, I'm, do you do you, are they pushing it just as bad over there they are, as they are here? Or what's the difference? There's a lot of mask wearing here, but I don't know anybody here who got any kind of medicine mm. injected into them. Mm, this? Okay. Yeah, I don't know anything. Really? Anybody got that. And, I, and everybody I talk to, they are pretty aware, no, I'm not going to do it. Mexico is a very compliant society to begin with. They're used to doing what they're told. So they're all wearing, mm -hmm. and I don't know when that's ever going to stop. It, it was funny. I was in line at the airport in Mexico City a couple of weeks ago, and a lady had a bottle of antibacterial gel in her pocket, and she was moving it from one pocket to the next pocket to this pocket. She was very nervous, and she was wearing two masks. Yeah. And I said, is that antibacterial gel? She said, yeah, do you want some? I said, you know that COVID is a virus, right? But the antibacterial gel doesn't work against the virus. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, man. <laughs> and you know the virus can go right through the holes in both those. 
masks, right? <laughs> it's like a chain link fence to a fly. You know? Yeah, but people, that lady had had three of these. Really? Yeah, she oh. told me. Yeah, I had two and my booster. Wow. She was all proud. Yeah. What Have you been back to America since you've been in Mexico or you just stayed there the whole time you haven't come back? I have traveled the world. I spent a month in Italy last summer. And one of my philosophies is get what you can get while you can get it. People pay me a lot of money to hear me say that. Get what you can get while you can get it. I wanted to write this book in Venice, Italy. This is a book I was getting prepared to write for seven years. I was, in, I was intimidated. It's 330 pages. I really wanted to do an amazing job because when I was in high school, I studied creative writing with a guy named Frank McCord who won the Pulitzer Prize in 1996 for his memoir, Angela's Ashes. And I wanna follow in his footsteps. So I wanted to do the most incredible job on this book. I was intimidated by the book I w until I went to Venice, Italy in October of 2019. I was celebrating. I had just held a big conference with Martha Stewart, Ice-T and Coco, Michael Gerber, uh, Jerry from Ben & Jerry's at Carnegie Hall. And I took my wife on a tour of Europe and we spent a couple of days in Venice. And I said, wow, if I could go to Venice, I could do a great job on this book because it, it's so creative and in the ingenuity of that city, it's just unbelievable. I had to wait a year and a half to be able to get back to Venice. Last July, we spent a month in Venice, Rome, Florence, and Milan, and I wrote this book. Then we went to London. We got into London. I did speaking events with Nigel Farage at the London Stock Exchange. We spoke at the Royal Society of Medicine, Oxford, Cambridge, and I took my group of celebrity entrepreneurs on that tour in September of 2021 because we had to get what we could get while we can get it. Now that tour could not be possible because you need to have your papers. May yeah, I see yeah. your papers, please? I have basically given up on it. I'm, I'm like, you know what? I had a good time in my 20s and 30s. I traveled as much as I could. And I've accepted the fact that I'm probably not going to be traveling anymore. I mean, you know, they want to bring it on domestic travel and they want to bring it on interstate driving. They want to, that's what they want. You know, I, I just, I'm not going to comply. And I guess my days of traveling is over. I'm flying to, I used to love to go to Costa Rica, Mexico. I used to love to go to Europe. I'm not, I'm done. I guess I'm done because now where I see it, where it's at right now, look, it's only a matter of time before we need a chip. Yes, you're right. Well, look, that's coming. Mexico still doesn't even require a COVID test for domestic travel. Wow. You can get on a plane in Mexico and just with an ID. That's it. With your boy. Really? So you don't have to be, you don't need the swab and you don't need this. You don't even, you don't need anything to fly really? inside Mexico. You don't need anything to enter Mexico except a passport. Wow. Well, shit, you don't even need that, to be honest with you, when I cross over there. <laughs> Yeah, you can drive across, right? Yeah, yeah. But, yeah you know, yeah. the beauty of Mexico is that Mexico is a Catholic country. Yeah, yes. And unfortunately, the powers that are trying to take over the world want to destroy real religion. Yeah, the religion is the state. So one of the reasons why I love Mexico and one of the, one of the reasons we came here is because I feel like this country first of all, is not a first world country. The targets right now are the first world. The targets of the war are first world nations. I don't want to be in a war zone. Man, I America used to, to like ground to zero. live in a war zone, you know? Well, you're living in it right now. If you live in New York City, you're living in a war zone. I don't want to live in a war zone. That's why I'm in a third world country. Ground zero. <laughs> ground zero is Catholic. New York City and California. Exactly. And unfortunately, that's you know, where I, my base is. I mean, I'm still officially a resident of New York City. Are, are you planning to stay there the rest of your life? Or do you feel that enough's going to happen this year by the midterms that we're going to get America back? And are you planning to come back if that happens? Well, I do believe that good will triumph over evil. I really do. And they say nothing can stop what's coming. That, it, that we've already won. It's just a matter of playing itself out. And I have to believe in all of that because the alternative is a very grim reality. So I do believe that that's gonna happen. And I don't, the other thing is, is that the opposition, 
the leadership of the opposition is so freaking stupid. It just blows my mind. They they are so dumb. <laughs> right. They are dumb. For them to have chosen to be on the wrong side of history was their first stupid mistake. And then the things that they do and say is astoundingly stupid. And yet they're smart enough to lie, steep, steal, and cheat. That they're smart enough to do. That seems to be the thing that they're best at. Well, because they own the system. They own the money. They own everything. So unlimited yeah. funds to do anything they want to do. So hey, man, I have not stopped my life. I did, I did 24 events last year in Mexico, in London, in Los Angeles, in Las Vegas, and in New York. I did events all over the place. I'm not stopping my life for anything. And that's another thing is that you cannot stop living your life. As much as I spend as much time here as possible and I don't want to leave, I know that I have to leave to do work. I'm going to be speaking at an event in Dallas in February. I'm going to be speaking at an event in San Diego in March. I've got an event of my own scheduled in Las Vegas in June. So I, you know, I don't want to leave here, but I do leave for work because the world doesn't stop. Life doesn't stop. You got to keep functioning as a, as a business person, as a, as a member of society and and as a person who wants to accomplish things that you want to accomplish in your life do i ever think that i'm gonna like if if you look at my youtube videos from a couple of years ago you will see so many videos that say i love living in new york mm -hmm. am i ever going to get back to that well here's the thing and i'm glad we got to this because i grew up in new york city in what was called urban blight Okay, the years were Abe Beam and Dinkins were the mayor. And there were boarded up windows and graffiti everywhere. When I was 12 years old, I got mugged on the street by the same guy two days in a row, right on Second Avenue. This is a great story. The first day I got a bicycle, when I was 12 years old, my first bike, my cousin gave it to me, cousin Barry gave me a 10 speed bike. I rode it around the block six times before a giant black guy with a switchblade took it away from me. He said, get off the bike. And I got off the bike <laughs> six times around the block. So those were the years that I grew up in New York City. When I went to junior high school 104, Robert Downey Jr. was in my class. And it, it was a scary place. And like, in junior high school, I never went to the boys' bathroom one time in the two years that I was there because I was afraid I'd get beat up in the bathroom. And then all of a sudden, New York was amazing. I can't, you know, I, I, I went to the University of Pennsylvania, I graduated from the Wharton Business School, and I come back to New York City, and it's Times Square is like Disneyfied, and it, every, the graffiti's gone, and crime is down. Those were the Giuliani years. Right. And, right. You know, do I believe that things can turn around? Well, based on that, anything can happen. After the crash of 2008, 2009, remember how bad real estate was? Yeah. I mean, I never in a million years thought that Miami would come back or that Phoenix, Arizona would come back or Vegas would come back. And yet they all have returned to real estate values beyond where they were after the real estate crisis. So. Do I think that we could turn this around? Yes. Do I think it can happen? I do. I, I really do believe that sanity can come back and that the world can be even better than it was. Yeah, I agree with you. I just think that uh, the correction that it's going to take when this happened, when, you know, let's say Donald J. Trump is reinstated, all these things happen, all these things play out. The correction is going to take, you know, from what I've talked to with Juanito, that this could take decades um, from the mess they've made. So with that being said, Clint, um, can I see your book one more time? And where can people get the book? Amazon.com, Wisdom of the Men by Clint Arthur. I put my whole life in this book, and it's got a lot of philosophies of success. And, you know, what I tried to do was to create something that people could go to to get the wisdom of generations of men. That's what's in here. That's incredible. And uh, let me ask you this one last question. Are there a lot of gringos in Mexico where you're at? No. No, huh? No. I'm in a city that's, 
See, there's a lot of corruption in Mexico, from what I understand. Yeah. Everything is pointed in the places where the powerful people make the money. Right. I'm not in those places. Mm. I'm someplace else. And I don't you're see off, a lot you're of You're off the beaten path. Yeah, I'm, I'm very much off the beaten path. And I like it this way. I really do. Yeah, I have a lot of family in Cihuatanejo, Iztapa, Guadalajara, Ciudad de Mexico. You should go uh, visit them. You know, I just, I haven't been confident in it because now that what you've told me, um, you know, I probably will now because I thought they wanted this and the whole thing. I'm like, I'm not doing it, but you're saying that they, they don't. All you need as an American, all you need is a COVID test to fly back into the United States. <clears throat> That's it. That was the whole thing about England. You know, I had, when I went to London for my events, Dude, I interviewed Nigel Farage at the London Stock Exchange. What a super cool guy. So smart and nice. And a lot of people didn't come from the United States for that event because they were afraid of the whole quarantine situation. And really what it was, misinformation, disinformation, propaganda, fear, and as, as fear, fear porn for sure. And as people of the world, you have to decide, am I going to let the propaganda stop me from doing what I want to do? Am I going to let the info war stop my life or derail it or send it in the opposite direction or make me afraid, make me live small? Or am I going to continue to live my life as much as I want or I, that I can? And you know, my wife and I have chosen to do what we do and to continue to try to be successful entrepreneurs and deliver value and over deliver for our clients just well i gotta say i gotta say you seem happy man you seem like you got a good energy about you so that being said maybe i need to <laughs> my ass to mexico <laughs> you know the only thing is there's some flies down here that's yeah, about it flies, but, but hey i'm a new yorker but fear is not my life and that's why i'm enjoying the reduction of stress and not not living in the middle of a war zone in new york city you know, my mom always told me, she says, get busy living or get busy dying. Yeah, mom. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> She's 100% right. Well, Clint, thank you for joining me, man. I'm going to premiere this on YouTube tonight. I hope we didn't say anything that could fucking bomb me on this channel. I don't think we did. Thank you for coming on, bro. I appreciate it. And everybody can check out The Wisdom of Men on Amazon, author Clint Arthur. And you've seen him on all the networks, man. So thank you so much, Clint, for joining me. Hey, man, keep up the great work that you're doing. You are doing God's work, and Thank you are a true American hero. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you and everybody. God bless America. God bless him for sure. God bless America.